Welcome back to the Herland Report. Uh, Eric Selle, you are the leader of a conservative party here in Scandinavia in Norway and you are also the president and founder of the Africa Israel Initiative and you have uh, broad work in many of the African countries. It's an honor to have you here, especially also because you view the world in a little bit of a different way than uh, what we see in the mainstream media today pertaining to Europe. And we're gonna talk about Europe because um, so many people wonder really what is going on here because obviously we see the mainstream media has an almost completely control over the political narrative that were uh, introduced to and dictated uh, you know, from, from the part of the media. But many see that the European population uh, feel quite differently than the political elites and the media elites about a number of issues in Europe. Uh, we've seen how Brexit uh, has shocked many. We've seen the unrest in Catalonia. We've seen the unrest in Italy. We've seen Hungary and Poland and other countries choose quite a different path than what seems to be the dictated uh, narrative from the EU. W what are your comments to, to the development uh, in Europe? Thank you. It's good to be here again. It's uh, to start in Norway and then expand to Europe. You know, in Norway, we have a very strong government. We have a very big government for a very small country. And the government is financing its own institutions, uh, media and the NGOs. And even if you go to the universities, if you want to research stuff that is not politically correct, you're not going to get the funds for it. So we have established a total information package, control if you want, that resembles countries we don't want to be identified with, where the same voices are financed from the same source, from the government, in the media, uh, to the universities and to the NGOs. And so anytime uh, you need some expert voice, you can always go to the academia or you can go to the NGOs and find somebody that is paid on the state ticket and, and subscribes to the political correctness of our time. And in that way, most people are checkmate because they don't know how can I stand up to, okay, one thing is the politicians, the other is all the journalists, 90% is, is come from the same background. And you got uh, the NGO experts suddenly saying the same thing. And then you got some guy or girl from the university saying the same thing. So how are people going to think for themselves? So it's actually, an, we're in a crisis uh, when it comes to uh, democracy, actually it's a democratic crisis uh, and we see now new media uh, outlets like Halon Report, your own, like uh, Reset.no, uh, we have Document.no, we have Rights.no, we have uh, a financial newspaper that is independent, uh, we have a Christian newspaper that is independent and all of these, are, they label them as alternative, like alternative uh, new uh, websites. In fact, it's it's the only independent, true independent journalism we have, uh, and there is a great gap uh, in Europe today uh, between the ruling elites and the popular votes. And it's very interesting what you're saying there, how uh, so many journalists are paid, or you see the PR companies, for example, we had an example in the Norwegian uh, state, uh, we even have a state TV here that receives billions, you yeah. know, and uh, state TV, and on the state TV uh, the other day, we had somebody who, you know, attacked the Herland Report and, and Steigon, and yes, do you, and we had a, a, a journalist, somebody that used to work uh, Hans William Steinfeld, who used to work as a journalist uh, in the state paid and run TV here. But a number of years ago, he quit doing that and he started his own PR company together with other people and he's now hired from, and who knows who pays him? And, and, and it, you know, they earn millions. And, and, and so he comes on TV strongly attacking us for somehow trying to be unbiased pertaining to Russia. Mm -hmm. You know, to see, I mean, it's very interesting to look at different perspectives 
perspectives of that somehow we're not allowed to do that anymore and nobody asks then who pays him to sit there and criticize and you know and to demand the continuation of the one-sidedness it, it, it's such a paradox to see and and the PR companies and the lobbyists uh, are very strong into this whole system too absolutely and it's uh, it's utter stupidity uh, which is uh, sort of uh, taking hold of our, of our society when it comes to Donald Trump's uh, campaigning and presidency. I mean, in the mainstream media today, up to today, it's it's hard to find. It's like CNN all over the place. Uh, and every time you get independent voices, uh, they try to stigmatize them either as alternative or preferably right-wing kind of extremist, uh, using words that doesn't make has no content anymore. Uh, the, the good thing is that, first of all, it's a great thing for the world that Trump won the presidency in the States because it really uh, put a stop to to the one-sidedness that was building up in the U.S. Because uh, U.S. also has its problem. For the first time, maybe since Reagan and, and uh, very few other presidents like Trump, he's going to be one of the greatest presidents in, in U.S. history. Why? Because he came from the outside. He proved whether you like him or not, whether you, you agree with him or not, he proved that you can come outside the establishment in the democracy of the USA and win the presidency. And, and in that way, democracy is much more secured in the US than it is here, because we have a, a political party system that is, you have to spend your whole life to penetrate to the top of the political party system in Europe. What you're saying is that we're even worse off than absolutely, the United States. Absolutely, I would, say, I would say so. But I think that there is, you know, Norwegians are very hard to, 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 to you, you, you can, try to uh, direct them for a while. But you know, Norwegians are used to, to battle the seas and the winds and the storms. We are the fishers and we are farmers. And you don't tell those what to do over a long time. And I, and I, I see a lot of hopeful developments uh, starting from the grassroots movements, like your own Halland report, because it shows that we still live in a time where there's enough action of freedom movement that individuals can still make a difference. And when you see through history, it's always been individuals taking uh, responsibility for their generation and the next, like, like Hans Nielsen Hauge, uh, you know, the uh, Norwegian revivalist that was jailed 10 years of his life. What did he do? He preached the gospel in this Christian country and he started businesses and made a lot of money and wealth for a lot of people. And he was arrested 10 years. Why? By the priests and the police chiefs. I mean, of the political correctness, because he challenged uh, the mainstream media of the time, the mainstream ideas of the time. But he changed Norway and, mm -hmm. and Winston Churchill, he was uh, demonized up to the very day that what he said for 10 years was going to happen, happened. Uh, I just went to the movies with my daughters this uh, January and saw Darkest Hour, uh, a powerful movie about how Churchill, you know, saved the night, uh, not the day, he saved the night, but he was demonized by the elite. And Chamberlain, he was welcomed by the masses when he came home from Munich and he uttered the most stupid words any politicians have ever said, peace in our time. You know, so if you control the media, if you control the, the upper uh, echelon, if, if you want, of society, you, you can actually mobilize those people. Those people that said to Chamberlain that he had created peace in our time were the ones that went through five years of war and suffering and Churchill became their man. So democracy, you know, it's, uh, it's a tricky business. Um, but we have to believe in the strength of individuals taking a stand for justice and, and righteousness. And there seems to be a tendency in history, I mean, we've seen it now with Google and Facebook and all of them uh, getting in the algorithms to, to, to remove the pages that are not, you know, politically correct enough and everything. And many are, 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 are feeling very bad about that. But then again, I would say that uh, freedom, people are initially really freedom seeking. I mean, there's a limit to how long you can uh, dictate dictate to a people that they are not allowed to, to think you know, or feel a certain way. And, and we see the continuation of a nationalist, national socialism really in Europe in many ways. It's, it's a strong current 
uh, the idea that you know we're, we're at a level in history that uh, we are the very best and everyone else is really so beneath us and and and, and that our time and our particular time in history is really the the best that the world has ever seen and it's really such a continuation of of, of that kind of sentiment and we saw also where that led I mean there's a limit to how much consensus you can demand in a population before there initially will uh, come revolts and people will wish for more freedom. We've seen that in history over and over again. So I think we're in a phase of maybe like a change of a paradigm where it, it, it's br the, the, the mainstream media, uh, totalitarian dictate of the one opinion we're allowed to have is breaking down. Mm, absolutely. And we're in the crossroads. There's, there's no question of it. I mean, we are uh, globally, but also in Europe, uh, we're in a hundred year crossroad. What happens the next uh, season, couple of years period is going to define the next hundred years. And either uh, the globalists and the Davos people and the multiculturalists are going to win, or the common people is going to stand up for their freedom and their rights. And that's happening all over Europe. That's why the Davos people is so mad about Brexit. Uh, you hardly see any uh, constructive analysis of the consequences of Brexit in the mainstream media. It's all always, uh, uh, you know, this narrative of okay, we can have another referendum. Uh, you know, these international, these globalists, I would say, these new liberalists. It's like Reagan said, if dictatorship comes to the States, it will be through liberalism. And, and he was prophetic, I mean, in the early 80s when he said these things. And that's exactly what we're seeing happening now. But the people are standing up for their freedoms. And you see that in Brexit. But the mainstream media says, OK, we need another referendum. Uh, there's only problems. It can never happen. Uh, you know, when Trump became, pre if he became president, the stock market would ca crash. Uh, unemployment would, you know, everything would go to hell basically if Trump financially, if Trump became president. Now the stock markets are higher than ever. He has brought more jobs to the states than Obama ever did. You know, it shows again that that uh, you know financial responsibility that the conservative agenda, the, the Judeo-Christian values in politics creates freedom, whether you're Latino or black or white or homosexual or heterosexual or man or woman, it's the Judeo-Christian values based in the individual's ability to maximize the God-given gifts that he has given to them that creates the societies that we want to live in. So I am, you know, I'm questioning why is the mainstream media not more, um, why don't they at least have a broader perspective of things? Why don't we see the, the potential that lies in Brexit, the potential of a Europe of free nations unifying? Because the Europeans are not making, taking a stand against a unified Europe. We don't, we don't want a federalist uh, Europe. We don't want a super government. We don't want bureaucrats in Brussels. That nobody, How can a bureaucrat in Brussels, a 25-year-old bachelor from somewhere, know what is best for the people in Vatsa up north of Norway? Now the Norwegian government is turning over our biggest resource of water and energy to a European system where we, we the, our, most, our biggest asset is our energy. We have energy demanding industry that creates jobs in Norway, but the Norwegian government wants to, to give this over to the EU, so we have to buy back much more expensive energy. So what's going to happen to our workplaces? What is going to happen to our industry? Taiwan, South Korea, these tigers of Asia, they showed that if you have a nationalistic approach uh, to business, to industrialization, and protect your interests, you create nations that become uh, financial locomotives, that, that becomes a blessing not only to their own people, but, but creates now the, the extreme uh, financial liberal ideas that the West put into the African countries. 
that, okay, we have cotton in this African country, so we will make cotton and sell it and everybody will. You know, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't work. It's made them poor. So on the nationalistic conservative agenda, we have empiric, empirical evidence that this is what works, that globalization becomes a, an unjust idea. It, it creates, uh, you know, um, inequalities. Uh, so we have to take this back. And we have to tell the people that meet in Davos. I saw just, we had just had the World Economic Forum. And I was actually totally surprised. Because for the first time, as far as I have, you know, seen, leading people in Davos went on television and said, we have met, the global elite has met in Davos to, to uh, design the way forward for the people of the world. I mean, that was literally what they said on TV. And I said, who asked you? Who are you? You are some CEO from somewhere. Who asked you to meet in Davos and make uh, a decision for the future for me and my kids? I never asked you. So as long as we want to maintain democracy and freedom and liberty, it's imperative that the people of Europe and America wake up today and yes. think for themselves. Yes, it certainly is. And pertaining to the mainstream media, when you see that over 90% of the American media is owned by only six corporations, half of those uh, also own the weapons industry in the United States, you understand very clearly why we have wars everywhere. I mean, the mm. only, you know, that's for one. And, uh, and, uh, and again, to see how the globalist, uh, when, when globalization or the idea of that first emerged and, and the internationalist, uh, you know, thought, the idea was really that Indians and people from poor countries would now partake in, 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 in you know, and, and, and become rich just mm -hmm. as, as uh, you know, and that you would have a leveling out of, of the income differences, but we see the very opposite. Exactly. So, 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 so that's one of the issues really with the globalist system. I'm, I'm thinking the mainstream media, you know, it must be quite a paradox for the leading editors and, and, and the leading commentators knowing that what they fight for really when they, pr when they remain faithful to that one-sidedness and biased explanation is really they fight for the one percent or the less the perspective mm. of the less than the one percent and that has never been a western idea mm. but you know think back to the soviet union you know the russians are really smart people i really respect uh, the russians uh, and i love russian culture been there a number of times lived in russia for two months uh, many years ago up in Murmansk, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's great back to the history of the Vikings, how close we were to Russia, you know, uh, all of this stuff. But uh, if you go back to the period of the Soviet Union in Russia, they had really smart academics working and believing and using all their intellectual capacity to make these 5, 10, 20 year economic plans for the, for, on the communist ideological platform that, that created famine and disaster all over. So what I'm saying is all these bright people were contained within an ideological framework, a mindset. See, and they could make the absolute most fabulous uh, economical structures, make PhDs, doctorates within and going to the same stupid destination. Why? Because they were contained in an in a mindset. Now we have the same thing in Europe. The journalists are contained in a mindset. I think a lot of them don't even understand that they are themselves prisoners uh, of a mindset. Some of them do because some of them have an agenda. But I think a lot of them are just like the economists of the Soviet Union. They, they really don't know that they are in the box. And it's always, you're always a revolutionary when you speak the truth in such an environment. I think you're correct that, that some of them don't understand uh, because this is also typically as we used to look upon the Soviet Union and feel sorry for them, you know, they exactly. lived under propaganda, we said, and, and it, 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 we, we don't understand, or many don't understand today that the propaganda we live on, on, under in the West today is probably even stronger 
than what they had in the Soviet Union at the time. And, and we've seen how, for example, um, you know, uh, fashion such as the Me Too movement, initially a positive thing. You know, women shouldn't be raped, they shouldn't mm. be misused, all of that. But it, it's been hijacked politically too. And Absolutely. even here in, in Norway, we saw one of the leading uh, uh, Labour mm. Party leaders, Tron Giske, mm. was removed from office mm. due to allegations. And it was all a bunch of allegations. Mm. He had touched somebody in the wrong way on the knee and somebody had felt offended mm -hmm. because he looked at the person or the woman obviously, you know, the women have the right to speak and whatever they say, whichever allegations women come with nowadays, is just taken up in the media and all of a sudden that's like, uh, you know, we don't need uh, uh, we don't need to take a case to court anymore mm. because exactly. the media really. So, so we've seen how the Me Too movement and Tron mm. Giske had to leave office mm. uh, due to that and he hadn't broken any law, he hadn't uh, done anything offensive according to the law. It was just small things, you know, I mean, just allegations, uh, not even of rape or anything like that. Mm. So, so it's just a paradox to me that nobody thinks who benefits from his leaving office. I mean, who so gained true. from all of that. So one should look behind some of these fashionable movements too. But the mainstream media speaks with one voice. Exactly. Everybody says the same. And in Norway at that time, uh, during the Tron Giske case, uh, many journalists wanted to write other things, but they were told to shut up. Mm. And now in the mainstream media, also in Scandinavia, we see how they are losing the money and, you know, they're removing people, letting people go all over. And, and, and due to this too, journalists shut up and they don't portray different sides of, of stories, but only say one singular uh, element and they all speak with one voice. Mm. So, so, so it's a deterioration, I would say, of the democratic system in the heart of Europe and in the heart of Scandinavia. Exactly, and we have to restart democracy in a way because you know we had democracy for for centuries now. It's it's something that is constitu uh, con uh, constantly developing, but we have to restart democracy because it's an old man. Democracy is an old man in Europe, and he needs uh, new inspiration. He needs new life, uh, and we have to rethink. Uh, how we have organized uh, our, our society. And I think if we shall save democracy in, in Europe, at least, for example, in Norway, you, you have to cut the state funding of the media because you won't bite the hand that feeds you. And when you have so-called uh, ideologically opposite media outlets where the journalists make careers jumping from one to the other when they, you know, you should think they were standing for different things, then it's just become another industry. And that industry has a po political interest. Now, for example, Tarja Tvet, the professor of history that just wrote a very interesting book about uh, the, the, Norwegian, um, the Norwegian society and government moving into a multicultural agenda, uh, he was interviewed by a, a journalist called Ole Torp on the Norwegian State Television. And uh, it was pretty obvious to me that uh, he probably hadn't even read the book. Because he was just throwing at the, the professor, a respected professor. I mean, it takes guts in Europe today to write something that is not political correct. So, you know, you should respect him whether you liked his book or not. But it was obvious he hadn't read the book. And he just threw at him you know, accusations, trying to, to portray him into a corner that would sort of delegitimize uh, the whole book. Uh, you know, this is a problem. And uh, so I think my, my suggestion is for, for starting in Norway, cut the funding of these, uh, these media outlets, let, let the new initiatives grow up, let people be free. They have to be free because, in, and, you know, remember back in the 80s, um, we even felt, you know, Russians, do they even believe Pravda? I mean, you thought, you know, you look kind of arrogant, you know, how can these Russians believe the Pravda? It's all lies. Well, look now, look now in Europe, look now. I have people that, oh, it's true. Why? Because it says in the Norwegian state television or some of the big <laughs> media and, and people feel very intimidated. There are, uh, you know, research in, in Europe, in Norway today, 
that finds that people don't dare speak their minds anymore. I have friends in, in, in the US, people that have supported Trump all the way. They don't dare even to say that they support the president of the USA. In, they are afraid, you know, to be ostracized, uh, uh, losing their jobs. I mean, we have slided into a society that we never thought we would become. And, and it's terrible. We were recently in the US interviewing Ron Paul and a number of other Americans. You look at CNN, all they ever talk about is Trump, whether he tied his shoelaces, or loosened his shoelaces, whether he wears a cap on going on to the golf course or whatever, and Mueller and all of that. I mean, mm. it's, it, it's just unbelievable. And the world has so many issues and so many problems. Mm. And yet we see the, the biasness and the one-sidedness and, and the lack of perspective portrayed. And that also exemplifies really the lack of respect for differences of opinion, which is a classical mm. conservative thought. And on mm. that note, exactly. I would like to thank you very much, Eric Selle, for taking the time to joining us here in your busy international schedule. I know you just came from, uh, from Israel, I yes. believe, and you're going again, traveling all over the world. And thank you very much for taking the time to join us here at the Herland Report. Thank you. Thank you for having me.